We are delighted to have Dr. Rodmacher with us today. His ministry from the Word has been helpful and encouraging. This series on right thinking is one of the most critical series that we could have because it is foundational for all of our understanding of the Word. As those of you who have been here throughout the day know, Dr. Rodmacher is president of Western Conservative Baptist Seminary. He has been used by God on many teaching occasions. Campus Crusade for Christ uses him at their Institute for Biblical Studies, and we are delighted to have him ministering to us today. Dr. Rodmacher. One hundred and fifty years ago, Daniel Webster said, If the religious books are not widely circulated among the masses in this country, I do not know what is going to become of us as a nation. If truth be not diffused, error will be. If God and his word are not known and received, the devil and his works will gain the ascendancy. If the evangelical volume does not reach every hamlet, the pages of a corrupt and licentious literature will. If the power of the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of the land, anarchy and misrule, degradation and misery, corruption and darkness will reign without mitigation or end. It would seem that uh, Daniel Webster, speaking 150 years ago, was speaking somewhat prophetically uh, with regard to some of the situations which we face today. It is not the absence or the lack of availability of good literature but I, sim I think that simply that we have not made ourselves available to it. Uh, therefore, I'd like in the beginning in this last hour to suggest a couple of helpful procedures in following through the process of right thinking as far as books are concerned. I'm not a great one for recommending commentaries. Uh, usually commentaries do you the least good when you need the most help, and uh, so I'm not keenly interested in commentaries. But I am interested in tools that get you into the Scripture. I'm not nearly as interested in a man's synthesis of what the Bible says as I am in what the Bible says. And uh, one of those books that I'd like to recommend is in your library. You might want to jot it down. One of the simplest books that I know of for helping you to get into the Word of God is a book called The Joy of Discovery. The Joy of Discovery by Oletta Wald, the first name O-L-E-T-T-A, and the last name Wald, W-A-L-D, a paperback book that you can pick up for a dollar and a quarter, or you can get it out of your library here to uh, apply it in your process of Bible study. Most people that read the Bible do not appreciate that which they read because they somehow believe that a, chap a chapter a day keeps the devil away, and if they'll just read a chapter, irrespective of what they do with it, that it will somehow change their lives. So it's got to be that commitment by the Spirit of God that goes with the reading of it, and it, there has to be understanding before there can be commitment. So some procedure of actually asking what the Word is saying and will be helpful, and that's what Oletta Wall does goes through four steps of observation, interpretation, application, and correlation. And I guarantee you that if you simply implement those four steps in any verse of Scripture, it will make that Scripture a new word of God to you. That's one book that is helpful to lead you into the understanding of the Scripture. However, I'm more concerned about the study of the Scriptures themselves. So one other thing that I would recommend is something that has come to my attention just recently, namely the entire New Testament on tape. And I understand this has perhaps been brought to your attention here as well. Uh, Alexander Scorby has uh, read the entire New Testament on 12 cassette tapes. And I'm sure that's available from a number of places. The American Bible Society has it. And uh, Paul Locke, Bible teacher in Tulsa, uh, also has it. But I can't think of anything much more exciting than as you are driving down the highway, rather than listening to radio and trying to find a program that's worth listening to, uh, why not have in your car a cassette 
player and put in a cassette of a portion of the Word of God and begin to play that over and over again until that becomes part and parcel of your way of thinking. I know of nothing that can change one li one's life uh, more than that. In the Old Testament times, before they had the process of printing and before they had books as we have them and when they had scrolls that were handwritten, uh, they did not have them readily available for everybody so that the Jew could not depend upon the dozen different translations of the Bible that he would have on his shelf to study, but rather he had to memorize the Word of God. And the reason David could say that he meditated upon the Word day and night is because he had memorized the Word. All of the Word that was then available he had memorized he had committed it to memory and therefore could meditate, it on, meditate on it, could continually bring it up again and again and again and rehearse it and go over it as he was going through all of the other things that he was doing during the course of a day. So instead of having a lot of other things running through his mind, he could have the Word of God running through his mind. And that's why then he could write the experience of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that is going through this kind of a practice for he's going to be a happy man, a man that experiences the joy that Paul was talking about this morning in Philippians chapter 1. So just letting the Word of God run through your mind. And I have thought recently, why should it be considered too big a thing to memorize the Word of God? That might sound like a, a monumental task at this point, but supposing you spent as much time seeking to memorize the Word of God as the average person spends watching TV. In fact, the next time you sit down to watch TV, why don't you keep a chart of it? And for every hour that you spend on TV, spend a proportionate hour memorizing the Word of God. It might be amazing how much less TV you stop, uh, start watching and uh, how much more of the Word of God you will begin to know. Discipline yourself. Make out a stewardship ledger. Don't expect God to somehow drop upon you mystically a spirit-filled life that's going to change you presto, you know. It's done by a process, as we were suggesting in the last hour. And then one other unique approach to the Word of God that I want to suggest, and I'm sorry I don't have these with me. I sent an entire box of the Life of Christ in stereo, a box of, of books a week ago, and they didn't get here. The invoice got here, but not the books. <laughs> but we gave the invoice to Mike here, and he can take care of that. But uh, we, uh, we do have a sheet of paper to pass around. Is that available out there? Or? It's on the book. It's in the book nook. That's that table out there. Why, why do you call that a nook? Uh, all right, there's a sheet of paper out there. That may be convenient to you. Or you may just want to take a card out of the pew and put your name and, and address on a card. And uh, this box will probably come in tomorrow. And if you're interested in getting a copy of the book that I want to mention to you just now, you can. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, it, interested in it, not because I received the royalties from it, for I do not, but uh, because I had something to do with it during the last three years of its uh, development. The book, The Life of Christ in Stereo, is not a record. It's a book. But it's called The Life of Christ in Stereo because it brings all parts, all four parts of the life of Christ together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in one consecutive chronological uh, presentation without leaving one word out or adding one word in to make a complete story. Now, that's been attempted several times in history, but it's never been accomplished, as far as I know. So I want you to know something about the work, for I feel that it's something of a miracle book in our generation. A man by the name of Johnston Cheney was preparing for the ministry uh, prior to World War I in a particular denominational college. And in that college, his Greek professor in the process of the classes, convinced him that the gospel accounts were unreliable, that they had contradictions in them. And uh, Jack Cheney listened to that, and he looked into it. It seemed uh, that what the professor said was true, 
And therefore, he came to the conclusion, if the gospel accounts were not reliable, then we have no reliable account of the life of Jesus Christ. And if we have no reliable account of the life of Jesus Christ, then I have no Christianity to present. And if I have no Christianity to present, what in the world am I doing preparing for the ministry? And so he did the only honest thing that anybody could do, namely he got out of preparation for the ministry. It'd be good today if all the other preachers who no longer have a message to preach would also get out, but uh, he did that uh, in all honesty. At that time then, he w went into World War I, and in the course of uh, World War I, uh, he got back into fellowship with the Lord again uh, through the ministry of one Dr. W.B. Henson, uh, later uh, or then the pastor of the Eastside Baptist Church in Portland, Oregon, and later became the Henson Memorial Baptist Church. When they came back from the war. They didn't have a GI Bill like we had after World War II, and with a family, uh, he did not feel he could go back to school again and complete his studies for the ministry. So he remained as a layman and became a wherever distributor, ultimately working out of Oakland, California. When he was in his middle years, I hesitate to identify what those years are, but uh, when he was in his middle years, he uh, contacted a double case of tuberculosis, what was then known as pulmonary tuberculosis, and galloping consumption. And the doctors did not give him any hope at all of living. And while he was on his deathbed, he said to his wife and certain others that he wished that he could still give some time to solving the problems of the Scripture that he had been confronted with during early days in college. And so he asked that his Bible be brought to him and a scrapbook and a pair of scissors, which they did. And he proceeded to go through the Gospels and to clip them apart and see if he couldn't take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and weave them together without contradiction. That led to a rather interesting study. Uh, that deathbed hobby lasted for seven years in that bed, and uh, he discovered many very significant things. And one of the first things he discovered was the, an answer to the oft-repeated criticism of the Bible on the basis of Peter's denial of Christ. You remember on one occasion, Christ said, Before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. On another occasion, he said, Before the cock crows twice, you shall deny me three times. And literal or liberal critics have often brought this up to demonstrate the, the uh, contradiction in the gospel accounts. And they have said, if the gospels contradict themselves in such a simple thing as that, the difference between one and two, then surely we may expect contradictions in the more difficult things like the nativity account and the resurrection account. And no less a liberal author than Dr. Robert Coughlin in a special edition of Life magazine on the Bible in December of 1965, had one caption going across two pages which said, the Bible in many and important details is contradictory, and especially the Gospels, and he cited the denials of Peter and the statement of his denials as a case in point. Well, interestingly enough, when Cheney went through the process of putting these four Gospels together, and by the way, in the process, he memorized the Gospels, <coughs> not in English, but in Greek, so that he was able to interweave the Gospels in his own mind together. One thing that was mentioned in one Gospel, he could interweave with one in another Gospel. And when he got through with that process, he found that there were not three denials by Peter. There were six denials by Peter, three before the cock crowed once, and three more before the cock crowed twice. So the biblical record is exact. But in 2,000 years of church history, that had never been discovered because nobody has ever put together the four Gospels. The things that we call harmonies of the Gospel are not harmonies at all. They're four solos standing side by side for they have never put the four Gospels together. But Jack Cheney, a layman, did that. Well, that lasted seven years in that deathbed and then 16 more years. 
And uh, the last three years, I had the opportunity of working with him on that as a theological consultant, though he did all of the actual work of the compiling uh, of the Gospels together in one consecutive account. The, another factor that he learned was that the ministry of Jesus Christ was not three years, but four years. challenge you to study that through. Scholars have been working over how they could possibly get all of the events of the life of Christ uh, into that last year that are supposed to be in the year, and it's a total impossibility. Uh, but they have gone on wrong assumptions in believing that there was a three-year ministry of Christ for there was a four, which be, four-year ministry, which comes, becomes quite apparent in Cheney's work. Well, he completed that work when he was 76 years of age, and he demonstrated the gift of the utterance of knowledge, the ability to bring all the facts together and to organize them and systematize them in such a way that others could then use them. And when he finished his work, he did as was his characteristic. He wrote me a letter that day, two pages long, single-spaced, typewritten, and at the end of the letter, he forgot to sign his name. He was in such a hurry. And the last line said, I have finished the work. I must pack my bags now and hurry home. He'd been away from Oakland for a month then at the seminary. He didn't know far how, how far home he was going because that day he went back to Oakland had a stroke, and went all the way home to be with the Lord. But just before he did, I was able to get a telephone call into Oakland, and I talked to his wife, and I said, Tell Jack that the work is on the way to the printer. At this time, he could no longer speak because he was paralyzed from the stroke. And when they gave him the news, he motioned to them to give him a pencil and paper, and with a half-paralyzed hand, very... Uh, uh, shaky, he scribbled on a piece of paper, I love you all, and he closed his eyes and he went to be with the Lord. Twenty-three years after, they told him that he was on his deathbed. And he produced a book that I believe is one of the very most significant books of our generation. Now, I'm interested in books that have to do with the Bible, and I'm interested in getting people into the Bible. And this book is nothing more nor less than the four Gospels. And the reason I wanted to particularly emphasize it today was because it ties right in with what we were talking about in the last hour, the need to get into the study of the life of Christ. I am convinced that the average church member has spent far too much time studying the death of Christ in comparison to the amount of time he has spent on the life of Christ. The death of Christ has absorbed the interest of the evangelical world in our generation. And the death of Christ will never cause you to grow one smidgen of an inch. The death of Christ is not a growth message. It is a birth message. The life of Christ is a growth message. And Jesus Christ lived that life in order that there may be a pattern life for believers, that is, those who have been born again by the death, burial, and resurrection, to copy his life and to walk in his steps. One of my professors in seminary uh, told us one time that he had been preaching in a particular church for seven years when one of his elders came up to him and said, Dr. So-and-so, uh, don't you believe in the Gospels? And he said, why, certainly I believe in the Gospels. Why do you ask that? He said, I just wondered. You never preach from them. I don't know how many times he had been through Ephesians. And by the way, if you go into a church that's got a Dallas man for a preacher, you can be sure you'll be through Ephesians a good many times in the history of that church, usually. And that's good. But that professor who said that was also a Dallas professor. And one of his courses after that be, that became one of his most famous courses was the course, The Life of Christ, because he realized for the first time the tremendous importance of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to see the warped presentation we've had in our day, take a typical hymnal and compare the number of songs written on the death of Christ with the number of songs written on the life of Christ. 
and I think you'll be amazed. When I shared that with John Hubbard of Far Eastern Broadcasting Company, he got so excited that they chose The Life of Christ in Stereo as their book of the year for two years through FEBC. And then he wrote me back and he said, We are eating, sleeping, drinking Life of Christ in Stereo. He said it's presently being translated into Vietnamese. Then he went on to say, I have personally written 200 hymns since receiving it on the life of our Lord, giving complete musical coverage to the life of our Lord. I don't think of anything that could have made me happier. This is an emphasis that we need today. People need to master the life of Jesus Christ. Because in his life, you see the principles of God worked out in living action. And if you are going to know how to live your life in Christ today, you need to look at the pattern life of Jesus Christ. So that that is part commercial and part exhortation. I do want you, if at all possible, to get a hold of that book primarily because I know it will be a tremendous treat to your spiritual life. Anything, however, that can get you into the Word of God to understand it better is certainly worth the investment. Now, as a final thrust this evening in the moments remaining, I want to speak something concerning the problem of right thinking. For surely someone is going to say, well, it's all well and good, to talk the way you are talking about the premise and the process of right thinking and the product that will come from right thinking. But frankly, I've got a problem with right thinking. Uh, I find that though I would try to think right, uh, I have wrong thoughts coming. Now, some of those wrong thoughts are something that you can do something about. Uh, When you men go by the magazine counter at the airport... Uh, One way to help your right thinking is to skip over the books, The Sensuous Woman and The Sensuous Man, and to skip over Playboy magazine and Man and Satan and a few other books. Uh, Playboy magazine last year had a five million circulation. It's no wonder that we're thinking the way we're thinking sexually. So there is one thing that you can do to avoid some of the wrong thinking that's going on in your mind, and that's to stop reading a bunch of garbage. That will help a great deal. But there are many, many other thoughts that come our way that we really can't do anything about. If you're going to be living in today's world, you're going to contact them. If you're going to drive down the highway with your eyes open, and I hope you do it that way, Uh, you're going to have to read and see billboards. And uh, if you walk down the street, you're going to have to see advertisements of theaters. If you happen to look through the daily paper and just turn one page after another, you're going to see things that create thoughts in your mind that are not wholesome. Seemingly, there is practically an omnipresent army of evil forces actively engaged in a program to pervert our thinking. And we need to be aware of that. There are others than God making an appeal to my mind. Ultimately, there are two in this universe who have a will for my life as a Christian. God the Holy Spirit has a will for my life, and the God of this age, Satan, has a will for my life. And you and I need to reckon with the fact that at any specific moment we are accomplishing one or the other. At any moment I am either doing God's will or the devil's will in the Scripture. There is no in-between. Now at this theological moment you might accept that, but I know that in a practical moment later, you will make a typical statement something like this. When someone asks you if such and such an action was really of God, you may say, well, no, you couldn't really attribute that to God, but it wasn't of the devil. Well, who was it of? Well, it was of the flesh. 
Well, what is the flesh? Uh, is the flesh a third agent in the universe that makes an appeal to your mind? Not on your life. The flesh is not a being. The flesh is not a person. The flesh is the scriptural, ethical name for your old sin nature. The capacity in you to do evil that only does evil and only does evil continuously. And every evil act that ever is performed in your life comes through that capacity in you known of as the old nature. And every good act that comes out of your life comes through that capacity in you known of as the new divine nature. And the new divine nature cannot be responsible for evil and the old sin nature cannot be responsible for good. But neither of those is the energizer. Behind them is an active agent. And these two agents are the same two that have been in combat with each other since before the creation of the earth. And in Genesis 3.15, you have them plainly stated, there is the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent as the agents on earth carrying out these wills, so to speak. Let me put it for you in a little more graphic form. We speak of the doctrine of the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit. The word control is used not only of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God, it is also used of the devil. The same word is used of both activities. There is not a different word used for the possession by the devil than the word used for possession by the Holy Spirit. To be filled or to be controlled or to be possessed are all one and the same thing. They all translate the same word, and the same word refers to both God and Satan. So that a believer is at any moment submitting to the allurements of either God or the devil. Now, the God of this age, Satan, works through the media, the multimedia of the world to make an appeal to me through my old sin nature, that capacity in me which responds to his appeal. On the other hand, God the Holy Spirit makes an appeal to me through the word, truth, by means of that new divine nature, that capacity in me for righteousness, in order to get me to do his will, so that I am receiving appeals from two directions, through two media, by means of two capacities that are within me, but there's one me. And at every point of decision, I am deciding one way or the other. I am throwing the controls one way or the other. You cannot throw the controls both ways at the same time. Any more that you, than you can turn the steering wheels on a dual control car both ways at the same time and go both left and right at the same time. Uh, that is an impossibility, in case you hadn't figured it out. And the same thing is true here. You cannot do the will of God and the will of the devil at the same time. They are mutually exclusive and there is no compromise between them. To not be doing the will of God in any specific instant of decision is to be doing the will of the devil. There is no third man there. There is no theological no man's land, which is a convenient dumping ground for everything that you can't blame on God and don't want to blame on the devil. There are two. 
Now, several of the verses that I mentioned to you are found there in Romans chapter 6 and, and 7 and 8. Uh, just to stress the twofold nature of this. Romans 6 and 16, talking about the question of sin. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are whom you obey. That is, you are a servant all the time. You are serving someone all the time. And there are only two. Look at them. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. There are only two. Look at Romans 7, 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, that is the sin nature, the law of sin. Two. Look at Romans 8, 5, and 6. For they that are after the flesh, the sin nature, do mind the things of the flesh, energized by the devil. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace and all of the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. And no matter where you go in the Word of God, there are only two. Someone wants to say, well, don't you think some things are just psychological? Well, that may be the medium that God uses or that the devil uses. But behind the medium is a person. And you may not be immediately aware of that, but if you traced every act back that was ever performed, ultimately behind that act is one who is energizing in that direction. And it's either God or Satan. For that's where the whole war is. If you've not become familiar with the late Donald Gray Barnhouse's book, The Invisible War, I challenge you to read it. Probably the best thing on the subject of that which is going on behind the scenes. And the war that's going on in the invisible, behind the visible, is a far greater war than any skirmish we ever see in our local situation. There's a real war going on today for your mind. Now, that's why, then, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10... Paul tries to correct the faulty actions of the Corinthians by going back to the heart of the problem. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You have to understand the sarcasm that Paul uses here in the first two verses. He got downright nasty with this Corinthian church. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, that is, according to your estimate, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence with which I think to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now he gives the clue. For though we walk in the flesh. Now, here he's not using flesh in its ethical sense, but flesh as the body. Though we're in this human body, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, lofty rationalizations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. See, that takes you back to where we were last hour. Right thinking begins by thinking right about God, the knowledge of God. And the devil will start right there. He will start by perverting your understanding of what God is like. Because if he can get a perverted God in your mind, he'll produce a perverted faith in you. And that's exactly where the devil started with Eve. 
He started by perverting her concept of God. And that led to the sin that led Adam to the sin that engulfed the race in sin. It started with a misunderstanding of what God is like. So he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, Paul uses the terminology here of warfare. He talks about war, and he talks about a battle, and he talks about captivity, and he talks about weapons. These are terms of war. And Paul says, believers, I want you to know we're in war. Now, one of the things that I really appreciated at Explo 72 last week uh, was the message of Dr. Billy Graham at the, at the luncheon on Tuesday. In fact, I have never been so impressed with the authority of, a, of God coming through a man as I was in Dr. Graham uh, last week. And in talking about the situation that we face today, he was suggesting that that we are approaching a time of revival. And he made some comparisons with 20 years ago, which after he made them, I thought were very legitimate. And that today there are some tremendous things that are happening that God is doing. But I think oftentimes we miss the things that God is doing because we are so absorbed with the fact that the devil is doing a lot. And so we see in my city, for example, that we have more divorces now than we have marriages. And in California, throughout the state, there is one divorce for every two marriages. In Los Angeles, it's one for one. And then we have other statistics, more suicides among college students in Los Angeles County uh, than any other kind of death among college students. The first uh, number one in killers among college students. And uh, then you read in the papers that uh, the sexual activities and the, some churches uh, uh, pointing or, or now ordaining homosexuals in the ministry, this kind of thing. And so we read all of that, and uh, we, we tend to only get one side of the picture. But I think there's an interesting thing happening today. We're seeing on the one hand some of the greatest activity of God that we've seen in this country, and on the other hand, we're seeing some of the greatest activity of the devil. So there is a twofold growth. Someone asked me, well, what did you think about Explo? I said, well, the devil was there, and God was there, and they were both evident at different times. And I think that God was a whole lot more evident, at least within the inside of the cotton bowl, uh, but both were there. And I believe it's going to be that way until we see Jesus Christ now. I believe we can expect as we come toward the end of the age that there's going to be a hotter and hotter battle. And the righteous are going to get more righteous and the wicked are going to get more wicked. And we're going to see the real pitching of the forces in a warfare. And Paul says, now we're in war, brethren. As we said this morning, we may sing about the sweet by and by, but we're in the nasty now and now, and we need to reckon with that. That's where we are. So Paul says, we have a war on our hands, but by way of solution to that problem, our weapons are not fleshly. We don't tackle the devil. A week ago over here in Tulsa in a message that I was bringing in that charismatic capital of the world, uh, one Pentecostal preacher in the audience got up and challenged me at the uh, end of the message uh, and told me that he's seen demons cast out and uh, he's seen all these miraculous, wonderful things and, and uh, told me about casting out demons. I think that a lot of Christians are getting far too absorbed in casting out demons today. I could care less about casting out demons. I don't want to give that much time to the devil. When Jesus Christ was on earth, he made a statement that we ought to remember today when he said, Now is the prince of this world judged. 
And when Jesus went to the cross, he took care of the devil. And if I want to defeat the devil today, I don't have to go out casting out demons. What I have to do is commit myself to this book and to the truth of the word of God. I don't have to give time to the devil to cast out demons today. If you go back and study history in the dark ages, they were tremendously absorbed with casting out demons, and that's what made the dark ages what they were. J.I. Packer, when he evaluates those days, says they were days of devil-dodging exercises and anti-satanic maneuvers. But we don't need a replay of that today. What we need to become absorbed in is not the devil, but God. All the time being aware that the devil is a very real foe, but a defeated foe. And I don't have to give him the time of day. I'll let God fight that battle. I don't have the, the ability to fight a supernatural being anyway. But Paul would remind us that our weapons are not fleshly. We don't go out and put on a boxing glove with the devil. We don't tackle the devil. Jude 8 and 9 tells you that even the prophets of old had more sense than that. The devil is, an, uh, is a supernatural being. Don't, under, don't underestimate him. Don't underestimate him. Don't get him caricatured as some character with uh, red flannel pajamas and, a, and horns and forked hooves and a tail and a pitchfork. That's not the devil. Paul says the devil presents himself as an angel of light. He masquerades as an angel of light and as a minister of righteousness. And I think far too many good Christian people are looking for the devil in the wrong place. Our weapons are not fleshly, but mighty, he says, through God. Mighty through God to do what? To pull down strongholds. Now, I'm sure that sometime in the past, your pastor has shared with you uh, something of what the background of this is, but he's looking back to warfare in their day. And he's looking to that great fortress, that castle on top of a hill. And every so often, you recall, it had those towers that would go up. And that was the place where the tower guard stood. And then some of those places, they would have uh, vats of boiling oil that they would dump all over on those who would try to come up the walls. And those towers were their strongholds. And Paul looks at it, and he says, we're going to take the strongholds. The weapons that we have in God are mighty through God, to the pulling down of the strongholds, to the fortress, the tower of the fortress, casting down high thinkings, imaginations. Notice the way he goes to the mind here. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now notice, Paul says the success in the battle goes by not letting one thought run loose, bringing every thought into captivity. Arrest it. When it comes, arrest it. Make it submit to obedience to Christ, and if it can't submit to obedience to Christ, cast it out. That'll be the best way to solve the problem of the demons in your life. For they work on falsehood, not on truth. That's why Jesus could say to the Pharisees who said they were of their father Abraham, he said, you're of their father the devil. And you know how I know that? Because you're a liar and he's the father of all liars. The devil specializes in lies, not in truth. So Paul says, every thought you have, captivate it. Now, how are you going to captivate it? Well, I take it you've got to have the grid of the Word of God built in your mind. And the greater that grid is, the less chance the false thought has of getting through. Some of you have seen a spider web that has been uh, woven in the corner of a room, and a fly comes along and gets entrapped in that because of the closeness of the 
the threads to each other. Now he says, build the grid in there. Build it fine. And if you'll build a good solid grid of the Word of God in your mind, then the thoughts are going to have to pass through that grid in order to find a settling down place in your heart. And if they can't pass through that grid, then the peace of God is going to be garrisoning your mind. Philippians chapter 4. And you're going to enjoy the kind of peace of God that he talks about there because you have this grid of the Word of God built in. Now, just briefly, what are a few of the elements of that grid? As you go into the Word of God and begin to make it part and parcel of your thinking, what are some of the things that you're going to find in the Word of God? Let me just mention several here. For example, think for a moment, staying with the knowledge of God, think of God as Father for a moment. What does that mean to you? Turning back to John chapter 15, in John 15, the Lord uh, gives that tremendous picture of the relationship of Christians to himself in the figure of the vine and the branches. And I don't know for how long I read this over when the only thing I gave attention to was Jesus Christ is the vine and I am a branch in the vine. And then one day it hit me like a bolt out of the blue that I had forgotten to even give attention to verse 1 the last part of it. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he lifts up. And every branch that beareth fruit, he cuts it back in order that it may bring forth more fruit. And on one occasion... I was asked to bring three messages on John 15, and just before that I had the privilege of living for a week in a vineyard with a man in his late 80s who had pruned grapevines all his life. And he took me out and showed me the different kinds of grapes and the different kinds of stocks and the different way they trimmed them. I never dreamed there were so many grapes and so many different ways of pruning them. And every grape had a different way of being pruned. And the crop that you would get the next year would be entirely dependent upon the wisdom of the pruner this year. And I thought, wow, what a picture. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. How much wisdom does he have? He's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows everything about me, and he's never forgotten anything about me, and he never finds out anything new about me. In fact, God never learns anything. I've got some students like that too, but for a different reason. <laughs> There's never been a day when God in heaven has ever been found there wringing his hands and saying, Oh, I wish I'd never brought Rodmacher into the family. If I had only known what he was going to be like. That kind of a thought has never passed his mind because he knew all about me from day one. And he brought me in knowing all about me. Now, he knows where to prune me. And the fathers, the ones that got control of the pruning shears, Jesus said. And he cuts me just right. Now, you let that grab you for a little bit, and that'll be a nice little bit to put into your grid that'll guard your thinking. You see, when Paul is talking to the Corinthians over in 2 Corinthians 6, who are walking in dependence on the dumb idols in their culture. And he says, look, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. If you'll, if you'll quit depending on dumb idols that have no ability to help you, then you'll find what kind of protection the living God can give you. That kind of thinking will change your living. 
or think for a moment beyond God the Father to God the Son. What is God the Son doing right now, right now? Is he making atonement for the lost? Not on your life. He finished that. What's he doing right now? Hebrews 7, 25. Right now, he's making intercession to me for me. For it says, he ever lives to make intercession for us. To save me to completion. To save me to the uttermost. Jesus Christ was not just interested in starting something with me. He's interested in finishing it with me. So his purpose at the right hand of the Father is to make intercession for me. He's praying for me now. And because he's infinite, he doesn't have to give just a piece of himself to me. He can give all of himself to me and all of himself to you and all of himself to every believer in Jesus Christ every moment of every day. That's Jesus. Now, you think about that. That'll change your life. Or you come along to God the Holy Spirit. And what is God the Holy Spirit doing right now? Well, Jesus said that he needed to go to the Father in order that he might send the Holy Spirit. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, that he would guide us into all truth. Back there in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are metamorphosed from glory to glory unto the very image of Christ as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's the Spirit of God doing today? When you're studying the Word of God and committing yourself to truth and the Word of God, He's taking that truth and He's forming Jesus Christ in you. And you never have to tell Him to do His job. He does it on time. God the Holy Spirit is active all the time. You see, when I begin to think about those things, it'll change my life. The grid of the Word of God, the truth of God, built into my thinking. And then you can move on over into the truths concerning yourself. For once you know the truths concerning God... You're going to understand better the truths concerning yourself. You're going to understand yourself better. And when you recognize that you are a temple of the living God, that's going to change your action, and it's going to change my action. I bring you one further illustration in conclusion. I used to attend a Bible Presbyterian church for several years in, in uh, southeastern United States. And uh, the man who was my landlord was also an elder in that church. And uh, a real fine man, a godly man, a witness for Christ. And on this particular Sunday morning, we were standing out in front of the church ready to go in. And, and uh, Jim was finishing his last cigarette. And I said, come on, let's go on in. And he said, no, I said, you go ahead. I'll, I'll come in a little bit later. I want to finish this. And I said, well, why don't you bring it in with you? He looked at me and he said, bring it in. He said, uh, bring it in there. I said, sure, why not? He said, well, that's the temple of God. You know, we always sing it in the choir. The Lord is in his holy temple that all the world keeps silent before him, you know. Uh, so that's the temple of God. I said, oh, is it now really? Why, I was of the impression you had that thing sticking in the temple of God right now. <laughs> that was the last cigarette he ever smoked. Not because he thought he was now some, you know, elevated spiritually in God's sight and God loved him better now than he loved him before. No, all of a sudden it hit him like a ton of bricks. This is God's temple. God doesn't manifest himself in buildings today. Even though we talk about this being the sanctuary, that just means we've got to cleanse our vocabulary. You're not sitting in the sanctuary now. The sanctuary is sitting in this auditorium. And this is God's sanctuary today. God dwells in me. You know, when, I, when that really gets hold of me, that's going to change a few things in my life. 
And even when Paul exhorts the Corinthian church concerning sexual sins, he appeals to the body as the temple of God. So there are certain things I don't do with this body. Why? To get a greater standing with God? No, I got the best standing you can ever get when I came in Jesus Christ, and that's righteousness. You can't improve on that. I don't do it to get a better standing. I do it because of who I am, not what I might be. And when that really grabs you, when you really begin to see who you are in God's sight, it'll change things you do, not legalistically, but by grace. Makes a difference how you think. For you are what you think. Perhaps even yet more than you think. May we unite together in prayer. Our Father, we've had a lot of time today to be able to think together, and I just want to thank you for that that on this particular Lord's Day we could set aside a good many hours of the waking day to, to really involve ourselves in the Word of God. And Lord God, I think of countries today, and we've just become aware of Russia, where they just couldn't do this. Romania, Poland, Many dear beloved people in Christ live there, but they couldn't do what we've done today. And I want to thank you, Lord, that we live in a country where we can. And Lord, I want to ask forgiveness for myself and for these, my bro brothers in Christ, for those times wherein we take for granted the privileges that we have. And forgive us, Lord, for the times when we've failed to act right because we haven't been thinking right. I'm reminded of Daniel's word, they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Lord God, help us even at this moment to make some decision with regard to what we're going to do with that which we've heard today. Father, we can just let it go by and let the devil steal it and destroy it like seed that was sown on rocky ground. Or we can right now begin to make plans to implement it in our lives. Father, probably many of us, if not most of us, do not have an effective program of daily getting into your word and feeding on the word of God. Lord, there's probably not a person of us here who could say with David what he said because we've never really committed the word of God to memory in its entirety. And yet there was a man who did and testified of the results of it in his life. And Father, I don't think it's too much to believe that people today could do what David did if we really took seriously the truth of your word. And I pray that there shall be some among us, Lord, that shall be so challenged that we shall actually set a program with long-range and short-range goals for our life for really mastering your word and building such a grid of the Word of God in our lives that the forces of the enemy will not be able to get through. And that the person of Jesus Christ will be so built up in our lives by the Spirit of God through the Word of God that people will see Christ in us. Help us, Lord, to be a concerned people in order that we may be a people that will enjoy what thou art really like. And Lord, the decisions that we have made, seal them 
to your glory and to our good. In Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen.